Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Kasdan, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. In the fall, with our partners at Heritage Radio Network and the National Food Museum, we organized a panel to reflect on the White House Conference on Food, Hunger, and Nutrition shortly after its completion. We called it What's Next. Our panel was great, and today we share their thoughts with you. Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Heritage Radio Network's Executive Director, Katie Mosman-Wadler, and I am so excited to welcome you all to today's webinar event. Before we introduce you to our moderators, I wanted to share a little bit about Heritage Radio Network. We are a 501c3 nonprofit media organization. We are funded with support from listeners like you and our partners. We have over 30 podcasts about all things food, drink, culture, and agriculture, with a mission to improve equity, sustainability, and deliciousness, you can learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. And please subscribe to our newsletter using the box at the bottom of our homepage. So briefly, let's talk about why we're here. In 1969, the first White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health led to a major expansion of federal food programs, including what we refer to today as SNAP and WIC. Fast forward 53 years, and as the United States navigates a post-pandemic landscape, more than 34 million people, including 9 million children in this country, are food insecure. In September, the Biden-Harris administration introduced a national agenda to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity by 2030 in advance of the second ever White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Thanks to our partners who curated this event, the Food Voice and the National Food Museum, we have an all-star panel of experts here with us today to discuss what's next. So with that, I'd like to welcome our moderators, Louisa Kasdan and Dr. Michael Jacobson. Louisa Kasdan is a journalist with extensive restaurant industry experience who now specializes in documenting people's unique food stories in writing via live events, and of course, as host of the podcast, Let's Talk About Food on HRN. She's also the co-founder of The Food Voice, a New England-focused nonprofit that advances public engagement in the food system. 
Dr. Michael Jacobson was the co-founder and longtime executive director of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. He is currently creating the National Food Museum, a museum with a mission addressing a range of issues from food history to the impact of food and farming on health and the environment. Today's webinar is the inaugural public activity of the museum. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over, Louisa and Mike, to you to introduce today's panel and our panelists. Thank you, Katie. Let us begin. So I just like to start with saying on September 28th, in many ways, the real action wasn't in Washington. It was in the recommendations that were released the day before. The Biden administration proposed a wide range of actions for the government and Congress to undertake. Implementing them would make a serious dent in hunger and diet quality problems. We are grateful that some of the key players are with us today. Our focus in this webinar is forward-looking. We want to talk about what specific proposals and initiatives have come out of the conference and how do we support them and keep the momentum going. We are grateful that we have people with us today who can really help guide us through that. Let me briefly describe who we're lucky enough to have with us. The first is Congressman Jim McGovern from my home state of Massachusetts, who's really been the beating heart of this effort to have a White House conference. We also have Marian Nessel, Professor Emeritus from NYU Food Studies and the author of a new memoir called Slow Cooked. We also have Darius Mozafarian, the Dean of Policy at Tufts University and a leading researcher on diet-related causes and diseases. Darius also represents here the Tufts Freeman School, which as many of us know is a prime mover behind this conference. And we also have Kirsten Toby, who's the co founder of Revolution Foods. Revolution Foods in California provides meals in thousands of schools and senior centers, and she is a policy expert on childhood nutrition and also represents a business orientation towards all of this. I am going to turn it over to Dr. Michael Jacobson to get us started, and I'll chime in when I need to. Okay. Hey, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Louisa. We've asked each of the panelists so limit their opening statements to just a few minutes, four minutes or so. Without any further ado, let me turn it over to Representative McGovern and hear his thoughts about what was important, what were the major recommendations, if you can nail a few down, what were any omissions from the report? Congressman? Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this, and I'm happy to be with this distinguished group of panelists. Look, I think Louisa, in her opening uh, remarks may mention the fact that the last time we had a conference like this was in 1969. Uh, that was the year we landed somebody on the moon. Um, and there was a time when we used to think big. And a lot of good things came out of that conference. I mean, WIC and improvements in the, in the food stamp program and labeling and a, a whole bunch of stuff that we all look back on now and say these were all positive developments. We haven't really had that kind of holistic discussion since then. And the problem that I have found when we talk about hunger or nutrition insecurity is that we're very siloed here in Washington. So if you want to talk about SNAP, that's the Agriculture Committee. If you want to talk about school meals, that's the Education and Labor Committee. You want to talk about food as medicine, well, that's the Energy and Commerce Committee or the Ways and Means Committee. But if one of the other committees intrudes on somebody else's territory, everybody gets all upset. We don't operate in a way where we come together as a whole and say, okay, here's the problem. What can you all put on the table? By the way, not just government, but the nonprofit sector, the private sector, the faith-based community, you know, everybody, anyone who has something to offer. Going back to when Obama was president during his first term, I've been advocating that we do another White House conference. When President Biden was elected, we began this effort even before he was sworn in to say, you got to focus on this issue. And they did. And this conference has the potential to be revolutionary. It brought everybody in a room all the different sectors to have a discussion, what works, what doesn't, what are some models out there that we need to emulate. And you had the president of the United States saying very clearly that it is the policy of the United States of America to end hunger and diet related diseases in this country by 2030. And they came out with this roadmap, a strategy, that position paper. I, I'd be here for two hours, three hours going over everything in it. All the things that the administration could do, the Congress needs to do, the private sector can do, and other sectors as well. 
this is an opportunity. This is the beginning of a conversation and of an effort to get this right. And it really is up to all of us to keep the pressure on. And to people who have good ideas that don't require Congress, don't wait for Congress to tell you to do something or the president to tell you to go ahead and do it. Then let us know what you're doing. We can build on that. I just came from a conference at USDA, and Dari Mustafari was there with me. It was a Nutrition Security Healthcare Summit that Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack organized. This is a direct result of that conference. Thinking about food as medicine was the focus of today's event, how we could better integrate nutrition and food into our healthcare system. The discussions are really, really good. There are lots and lots of ideas that we need to build on. But again, this conference has got all these discussions started, including a discussion on universal free meals for every student in this country. We need to be wind at the back of those who want to move forward. And I believe that this conference will produce lots of positive, good things that we will look back on years to come and say it was worth it. So let me end there. Let me follow up and ask you, is there enough bipartisan support on these critical issues that affect D's and R's to get legislation passed? Is there enough support? Yeah. Well, I I go to church every day and I light candles praying that that won't be the case. Unfortunately, much of what we're talking about over the years has become somewhat partisan here. And I don't quite understand why, because it used to not be. George McGovern and Bob Dole worked very well together in the 1970s to move important legislation forward to end hunger and to deal with nutrition and security. We need to get back to that. But by the way, Congress, people shouldn't wait for Congress and Congress can't fix this alone. One of the things that I'm really encouraged about is the fact that a lot of our governors and our mayors are wanting to take a lead on this. Some of this stuff can be led at the local level and can in turn put pressure on Congress to act. Some of the stuff that is necessary could be done right through regulation. For example, USDA can issue a regulation to make it possible for more and more schools to qualify for community eligibility with regard to free, we can expand that, thus making it easier for states to then say, okay, you know what, let's make this permanent. We will Mm -hmm. pick up some of the costs and let's make it the, in our state that every child has access to free breakfast and lunch, nutritious breakfast and lunch at school every day. Look, we can't control the politics of what happens in Washington, but I'm just simply saying, this is not gonna be fixed by Congress alone. And that's one of the things we learned in this conference. One of the points of friction between nutrition advocates and anti-hunger advocates has to do with SNAP and soft drinks, where some people would like to see soft drinks not covered by SNAP. One of these we do know that works is incentives. In Massachusetts, we have this program called the Healthy Incentives Program that basically you get double your SNAP dollar if you buy fresh fruits and vegetables at a farmer's market. It is wildly successful. The clients love it because they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. The farmers Mm -hmm. love it because it helps them as well. So we know that if we provide incentives, that people will make better choices. I prefer that, quite frankly, to a system where we're saying, you're poor, and so we're going to tell you, you can't buy this, you can't buy this, you can't buy this. By the way, Our nutrition challenges are not just a problem that people who are economically challenged face. Of course. Everybody does, right? So so we want to treat people like the way we want to be. We all want to be treated the same way. So I think incentives are a better way to change people's behavior rather than denying people the ability to make certain purchases. Thank you. Uh, Let's move on to our next speaker, Marion Nessel who's one of the most widely quoted nutritionists in the country. Marion, what do you take away from the conference? Well, first of all, I loved being there. And I loved being there not only because I was invited at the very last minute, but also because it was just wonderful to see all of the people there who I hadn't seen in three years who were all interested in the same kinds of issues. I thought there were three things about the conference that were extraordinary, maybe even more than three. One was it was laser focused on hunger. There was a lot 
lot of talk about diet related chronic disease, but the absolute focus was on making sure that everybody gets enough to eat. And that was really the focus of it. I thought that was a strength and a weakness. It was an enormous strength because it kept the focus on what is the most acute food problem that we have in this country. I suppose it's a weakness because the conference really wasn't about addressing diet-related chronic disease in the entire population, a population in which three quarters of American adults are overweight or obese. That really didn't get discussed. But the other things that I thought were terrific were the inclusion of people with lived experience of hunger. This is the first time I've seen that at a national conference. The woman who introduced the president of the the United States, was someone with lived experience of food stamps. The personal stories in every panel and in every session of people whose lives were changed for the better because of their participation in food assistance programs was extremely moving. And then, of course, it was a love fest very deservedly for Jim McGovern, who was really responsible for all of this. I thought that part of it was really terrific. What I missed was the greater focus on diet-related chronic disease. As I said, it was really not a focus of this kind. There's a lot of lip service to it and a lot of talk about it, but doing something about diet-related chronic disease would mean taking on the food industry, and that's not what this meeting was about. So it is fair to say that the recommendations did address chronic diseases to some extent, a couple of things are the fruit and vegetable bonuses in the SNAP program, front of package labeling and sodium reductions, voluntary programs. But when you look at the soaring rates of diabetes, soaring rates of obesity, it's just shocking. You see the numbers just go up, 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 up. Uh, somebody sent me a 1974 Washington Post article that said, So this is 1974, almost 50 years ago. Hunger has indeed been alleviated, but nutrition has made no headway. That's from a Senate panel, the Nutrition and Human Needs Committee. And many people think that that's the case today. We just haven't made progress on nutrition. Why is it so hard? Well, my view is that it involves taking on the food industry. It means stopping food industry production of unhealthy products. It means stopping food industry marketing of an unhealthful products to kids. It means creating an agricultural system that is focused on public health rather than on feeding animals or fueling automobiles. It really means changing the food system in ways that go against big agriculture, big food, and a lot of the very powerful corporate interests in the food supply. And nobody wants to take that on because it's politically impossible. Let's ask uh, Representative McGovern about that. Do, <laughs> All right. Do you feel pressure from the soft drink industry, the meat industry, the cheese industry, and so on. Look, I'm from Massachusetts, so we grow <laughs> cranberries. There's no doubt that people get on the Agriculture Committee to defend the subsidy of their state, whatever that may be. And it may be something that's not particularly healthy. We certainly need to move in a different direction. We need to improve our agricultural system in this country, one that is not about agribusiness, one that is about preserving our soil, preserving our environment, understanding what the impacts of climate change, and actually producing healthy food for everybody. We need a 50-state farm policy. We've gotten used to importing everything from halfway across the country and sometimes halfway around the world. That is a challenge. But it's, the food industry is one of the challenges. But our medical industry is a challenge, too. Our medical industry is about treating you when you are sick and not very much focused on preventing you from getting sick. And by the way, even when you're sick, treating you with the latest drug and not with food. And so we need a change of attitude there. Our educational system is totally divorced from food and agriculture. We have generations that don't know how to even cook, how to prepare food. That is part of promoting good nutrition and also stretching your dollar so you can actually afford more. So we need multiple systems to change in this conversation. For those who think that more time should have been spent discussing kind of diet-related diseases and how we address them in that conference, there were some breakout sessions that did that. 
But today, again, one of the outgrowths of that conference was what the Secretary of Agriculture did, and he held this conference today on nutrition security and health care. And this is the first of many post-summit conferences that will occur. So when we get to the next Farm Bill, that much of what was prioritized at this conference will be discussed. And I think some of the legislation that you're going to see come before Congress and some of the amendments you'll see to the Farm Bill will reflect a lot of the concerns that Marion has just mentioned and others on this conversation will mention. Look, awareness is growing. Public opinion is changing. There's awareness there that wasn't always there. And I think people want better food, want healthier food, more nutritious food, not just for themselves, but for their kids. I think that's the direction we're moving in. And this conference, I think, was a big gust of wind at the backs of those who want change. Let's move on to Dariush Mozafarian. Dari is a distinguished nutrition researcher. He's perhaps the strongest advocate in the academic world for improved nutrition policies. He's made Tufts really a leader, again, I should say. Thank you for having me. I agree with many of the comments that were made. I I will highlight a few key points um, myself. So first, the conference itself, the day itself, was really not that important. It was a nice day to bring people together. What was important was the national strategy. The national strategy was really what was important. And the White House was working on that for about 14 months. We had a conversation with the Domestic Policy Council in July of 2021 when they started working working and thinking about these issues. And so, and Congressman McGovern and others in Congress have been thinking about these issues. So that, the day itself was a culmination and a presentation of the national strategy. So really what's exciting and what's historic is the national strategy. And I think the national strategy is extremely ambitious and has a lot of really exciting things in it. The second point I would make is that there are things in the national strategy that the administration can do alone without new funding. Very, very important things, a lot of important things. And having the president say that this is a priority for him, having Susan Rice and the Domestic Policy Council say, yes, I get it, this is a priority for me, having Secretaries Becerra and Vilsack, the most important cabinet secretaries, say this is important, together with Secretaries of VA, DOD, Education, Transportation, Housing and Urban Development, uh, all of these Small Business Administration, Commerce, Treasury, all of these agencies were represented in the plan. And the administration actions in the plan came from the agencies, came from the agencies themselves. They're saying, this is what we're going to do. So that's what's most exciting. There are things in there for Congress to do, and there are things in there for the private sector to do, and those will not be as straightforward as agency actions. So I think it's a really terrific historic document. Even if 25% of it happens, it's now, what what are the most exciting, some of the most exciting things in it? So there's a lot in there about streamlining and modernizing access and participation in the federal nutrition programs. That's great. Whether it's school lunch or WIC or SNAP or Meals for the Elderly, there's a lot in there about making sure you can enroll, making sure you don't have barriers to stay on, making sure you can do online shopping, making sure you can think about and understand all all of your benefits. So that's terrific. And number two, there's a lot in there about strengthening nutrition, particularly in school meals and in WIC. There's a little bit in SNAP, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. There's definitely some in SNAP. I think there could have been a little bit more. The second exciting thing outside the federal nutrition programs is food as medicine. To me, that's the single most game-changing theme of the report because it's saying that healthcare, which is 30% almost of the federal budget, almost 20% of our entire economy, $46,000 a year for the average family of four, should be spent on healthy food. That's a game changer. Willie Sutton, the bank robber, was asked why he went to banks and robbed banks. He said, that's where the money is. Can you explain to us what food is medicine? What does it mean? Yeah, well, it could have lots of meanings, but I use food as medicine to mean integrating food and nutrition into healthcare. So when you go to your doctor, your doctor understands nutrition, they assess you for nutrition, and if you need healthy food, they write a prescription, and your healthcare pays for your healthy food. It's happening in Massachusetts, it's happening in Oregon, happening in California, happening in North Carolina, happening at the federal level with the produce prescription program, happening in the private sector. Five years ago, Tufts had zero grants on food as medicine. Today, we have 11 grants on food as medicine. We just got a $6.3 million grant from NIH, Christina Economos, going into the Mississippi Delta, working with black farmers to help them grow specialty crops, buying those specialty crops and giving it to low-income patients in Mississippi with diabetes and prediabetes and measuring the effects on their health endpoints. So food as medicine, I think, Mike, is the second really terrific 
innovation. I think the third innovation is advancing nutrition science. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. There's a lot of things we have to learn about the microbiome, child development, brain health, personalization, timing of meals, supplements, as the list goes on. So having a pillar and a focus on nutrition science, I think is important. And the last thing that is in the report, but isn't in one section, you have to find it. There's a lot in there on advancing business innovation. So there is a lot in there about the private sector. It's mostly carrots. It's not sticks. But there's a lot in there, a lot of carrots for the private sector to shift toward equitable food that addresses food security and nutrition security. And then just to finish, there's a few things that I think could have been in there that aren't. I'm 95% delighted. I don't want to be nitpick, but you ask, what would I have liked to see? I would have liked to see a little bit more focus on SNAP pilots, on letting USDA asking the states to innovate on ways to address food and nutrition security and SNAP and try different innovative approaches. That's one thing I would have liked to see. I would have liked to see more attention on structure and authority around nutrition science, in particular, a National Institute of Nutrition at NIH. And lastly, I would have liked to see something, some structure and authority to coordinate all of this, because we want this to outlast the Biden administration. We want this to outlast 2030. And there's nothing in the national plan about actually coordinating creating some structure authority like a national office of food and nutrition to coordinate this into the future. And in that 1974 article that you mentioned, Mike, Senate hearing, that was the number one message from the panel that there is no ownership of food and nutrition in the federal government and there's a need for a new office. That was their conclusion from 1974. But those are small minor wishes, dream wishes of a Boston cardiologist. I'm pretty happy with all the rest of the report. Thank you. The report mentions that the FDA is moving ahead, looking at front of package labels. And when some of us think of front of package labels, we think of the labels that are being used in Chile, Mexico, Israel, Uruguay, soon Canada, that have little foods that are high in added sugar, saturated fat, sodium, and calories. Do you think that kind of labeling would have an impact on what the public's eating? Well, I think front-to-pack labeling mostly has an impact on industry because industry doesn't ever want to have a red light or a negative thing Mm -hmm. on their thing. It has a small effect on consumers. We've done analyses showing it does affect consumer behavior, but its bigger impact does on industry behavior. So I think front-to-pack labeling could have a positive impact if the focus is correct. We've learned over the last 30 years that kind of reductionist nutrition science focusing on single nutrients, particularly nutrients that are naturally in foods, is unhelpful. I think a front-to-back label focused on salt would be okay. I think it would be better if it was focused on the ratio of sodium to potassium. I don't think a front-to-back label focused on added sugar or saturated fat would be useful. In fact, I think it would be harmful and drive companies to make wrong decisions and drive consumers to make wrong decisions. You just can't judge the healthfulness of a food from a handful of nutrients. So if there's going to be a front-to-pack label, Mike, which the FDA is considering, what I'd love for them to do is to do it based on a holistic nutrient profiling system that emphasizes food ingredients in particular and processing, also a little bit on some additives like salt and sugar. But if it's just salt and sugar on the front-to-pack, we're going to still have a really bad diet at the end of the day. That's just a little bit lower in salt and sugar. So I think we need to have a more holistic vision like the new FDA definition of healthy. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kirsten Toby. She's a co-founder of Revolution Foods. And you're at a place where the rubber meets the road or the vegetables meet the kids. Revolution Foods serves foods in thousands of schools as well as senior centers. What did you think of the conference? Thank you for having me on this. I shouldn't say the conference, the recommendations. I completely agree that it was less about the day and more about the sort of bringing together of the voices and the creation of the national strategy. Like others have said, it's going to be incredibly important to see what comes next, right? All these ideas, how do they actually come into reality? Because I am really focused on where the food meets the mouth, so to speak. Generally, I think the federal leadership on this is incredibly important and wonderful to see bringing together so many different agencies. It's double-edged. It's incredible to see it, but I tend to agree with with Dr. Mosafarian that if only we had a single agency that was focused on nutrition and food that could take a, a more unified approach, would make 
life easier for the folks at the, at the sort of end users, so to speak, whether it's a school food service director, whether it's an individual family trying to access their SNAP dollars. I really appreciate that school meals were front and center. It's such a huge lever that we as a country can continue to focus on for both food security and nutrition. There's a lot of great research on the power of school meals for both. I'm also on the side of things that thinks we should go back to universal meals. We did it during the pandemic and saw the impact that it can have. We now see the impact that it's having in California and a couple of other states, Maine. And it's clear that we can do it. And with the political will, it's possible to make food available to every single kid in school and reduce all those barriers, especially for the families that live on the edge and are in and out of the poverty line, the qualification line for federally subsidized meals. Love the focus on school meals, but think that there's more that can be done there. I'm curious to see how the Healthy Meals Incentive Program will play out, what that will look like. I think incentives can be a powerful force. I think food is medicine and starting to change the national conversation around food being a critical part of our healthcare system is important. I think there's still a lot to work out in the logistics of what that looks like and how you actually get the preventive medicine into the houses and onto the tables of the people who need it most. Mm -hmm. We've done just a little bit of work in that space. Things like home delivery are incredibly difficult and expensive to, to execute, but it's also hard to get the people who need the food most to come to places where they can access the meals that will serve as their medicine. So I think there is still a lot of kind of innovation that needs to happen to make that dream a reality. And we'll be back with the panel in a minute. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheese-making traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheese-making culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheese-making craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. And we are back. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to you, our listeners, and to the Biden administration the for holding the White are House doing conference as on much food, as they could hunger, be and to push this, these programs, uh, either as regulations, guidances, legislation? Are they doing as much as they could be or what more should they be doing? Well, if we're talking about school nutrition programs specifically, I think there is certainly more that could be done to increasing participation rates is what we're talking about. How do you increase participation rates in breakfast programs? How do you increase participation rates in after school supper programs? Because those are the two sort of lowest participation programs that there are. There's a lot of great work going on in schools to bring breakfast after the bell and grab and go breakfast options mm -hmm. directly into classrooms. There's been a lot of good research on that too, that if you open up the possibility of eating after the school bell has begun or after the school bell has rung at the end of the day for the for after school meals, there's a lot that can be done. I think there is still more that can be done at the policy level, particularly on after school meals. One of the things that we saw during the pandemic was that when schools were allowed to send after school suppers home to kids who were not enrolled in after school programs, you had much higher participation rates in after school meals, major impact on food security for those kids who didn't necessarily have dinner on the uh -huh. table. Is the industry, broadly speaking, doing enough to push Congress to pass some of the legislation, get USDA and FDA to adopt regulations? That's a great question. I'm not heavily involved in lobbying efforts. And I, I know that there are industry associations that are lobbying. I don't know that the industry associations are necessarily always focused on what's best for kids and nutrition. I think in many cases, they're focused more on what's going to drive the bottom line of the industries that are doing that pushing. So I think this is my personal opinion that we need to see more 
focus, whether it's from the industry side, from the private sector, or from the public sector on kind of what's going to be best for the kids, the families, the, the administrators of programs to be able to deliver the programs that need to be delivered. So just a very simple example for a school leader, you know, they're having well, to manage. Really, hold oh. the thought for a moment. I saw the congressman nodding his head when you were making some of those those comments. And how helpful has the um, School Food Association and food service industry been in getting legislation adopted or blocked? I oh, also that- see a big smile from Marion, and I bet she'd like to chime mm-hmm. in on this. <laughs> well, Congressman, your, your mic is turned off. Well, let me go to Marion because she'll make more sense than I do. So uh, <laughs> then I'll follow her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see about that. I don't know what that was about. The School Food Nutrition Association, is that what it's called? The School Nutrition Association is the lobbying organization for school food service workers. And you would think that it would be the organization that's at the forefront of fighting for universal school meals, better food in schools, more money for school nutrition, all of the things that school food advocates have been arguing for decades. They get about half their money from food companies that make products for schools, and they're put in a very awkward conflict of interest sometimes, so that they're not, in fact, the leading organization to be advocating for school meals. But I want to make a comment about school meals because the rules for school meals are extremely important, but carrying them out at the local level is extraordinarily school dependent. And in my experience, there are two skills. For schools that are making food and delivering food, there are two skills, making good food and getting the kids to eat it. And these are two completely separate skills in schools in which there are adults who care what the kids are eating. They make sure that the food is good enough and that the kids are eating it because they connect with the kids in an extremely personal way. And it's very hard to understand this from a policy level, but going around from school to school, Revolution Foods can make the best packages in the world, but if the kids aren't eating it, it doesn't do any good. That requires adults in the school, or I don't know if your company is involved in this, but getting the kids to understand how important food is, how much fun it is, how experimental it is. I'm all for school gardens and cooking programs in every school we can get them in, because those really make a difference. And let me just say, Congress isn't being pressured enough to do the right thing, number one. We, quite frankly, could use a little bit more outside pressure to make sure that reimbursement for school meals is higher so that school districts have some choice in the type of food that they provide the, their young people. The other thing is that we also need to understand that as we call for higher nutritional standards, which I'm all for, we got to make sure the food tastes good. The kids won't eat food that they don't like. Just like if you're in the hospital, you won't eat food that's good for you, but it doesn't, it tastes like cardboard, right? We have to be creative in terms of how we present food and how we prepare food. We have a lot of schools that don't have infrastructure to be able to prepare meals on site, to even be able to store fresh fruits and vegetables. Everything has to be brought in. And the other thing is to the extent that we can integrate nutrition in our curriculum, I don't even, you don't need a separate course, but just so kids begin to understand the nutritious value of certain foods, that will help. I've found when I visit school cafeterias that those cafeterias that have options and they are able to tell young people the nutritional value of this versus that, kids tend to make the right choices. I was at a public school in Washington, D.C. the day before the conference in a very economically challenged neighborhood. And one of the challenges there is not just getting people fresh fruits and vegetables. It's families are not used to the fresh vegetables that are being given to them. But in the schools... They're introducing fresh vegetables, and they're doing it in a way, the day I was there, they were introducing squash. Most of these kids at this particular school, their families don't prepare squash for them. This day, D.C. Central Kitchen was part of this collaboration. As kids were changing classes, they had three different types of squash, and the kids got to taste them. And the one that liked best, they voted for, and that was on the school menu the next week. Well, that not only helps kids appreciate the value of vegetables, but it also 
kids are teachers. They go home and they tell their parents, we want this. We have to connect the dots here, right? It's not just one thing. And so Congress's role in this ought to be, we ought to provide adequate reimbursement so that local communities can make the appropriate choices, including really appropriate food, depending on where the school happens to be. I think there's lots of room for creativity and growth and getting this right. And my hope is that one of the things that comes out of this conference are conversations that will get us to that point. I'd like to ask a question, especially to Dr. Mazafarian, because I listened last night to a speech that he gave last week on it. One of my concerns, and I don't know if anybody else shares this, is that food is such a big issue. Even putting it under one place in the government doesn't solve the fact that food is a big issue. How do we walk and chew gum with all of these different issues, whether it's school food or food as medicine or training of physicians and all the different issues we have and actually get something to happen to create momentum that moves forward and gets our communities to move forward? Tee us up a little bit on that. Yeah. So I think having a first an overarching coordinating office doesn't mean you put the budget and the staff and all the programs in that office. All the agencies, all the administrations purpose to stay the same, but you have a coordinator. And the analogy for that is after September 11th, Congress did an investigation and recognized that we could have missed some intelligence because the FBI wasn't coordinating with the CIA, wasn't coordinating with the National Security Agency. And so they created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in 2003 to coordinate national intelligence. And that office has been extremely successful. The Director of National Intelligence sits in the cabinet, sits on the National Security Council, meets regularly, I think maybe meets every day with the president, and has been an extraordinarily successful office. The threat of food to our country is bigger than the threat of bombs and tanks, right? More than 600,000 Americans dying a year, incredible cost to our economy. We need a similar office and a leadership in the White House, talking to the president, advising the president, guiding the programs. So it's a, it, the problem is food is everywhere. Nutrition is everywhere. It touches all aspects of our life, including culture and fun and family and sports and everything else. And so there is no single silver bullet. And so we really need to do a suite of programs. I think that if there are 30 or 40, there's not 6,000, there's 30 or 40 major actions, major things that could really move the needle on hunger, nutrition, and health. It's not one but it's also not 300. So I think if, even if we can do four or five of those 30 things, generations beyond us will thank us. If we can do 10 or 20, we're going to be incredibly happy and our kids are going to be incredibly happy and healthier. I'm curious about who is going to hold the country accountable for these various recommendations. One problem with the national strategy is that it had recommendations that cover absolutely everything. I wanted to see some very clear priorities and some measurable outcomes. Who is going to hold it accountable in the absence of an office that does that kind of thing? Is this something that we're going to leave up to the public? As Jim McGovern suggested, that this is a public thing and that we're expecting the public community to take charge of this without somebody leading it and without somebody in charge, it worries me. Let me just say, I'm not I'm not at all opposed to having a point person or an office that oversees the implementation of all of this. But let's not kid ourselves. You could have an office to implement this, but you could have an administration that is not sympathetic, and you could have somebody very bad in that office that could do a lot to undercut all of what we're trying to get done here. So yeah, there ought to be somebody. There ought to be somebody who every day gets up and says hunger and nutrition and security. Okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? We ought to have that. And there ought to be a point person. Right now, Susan Rice is taking the lead on this, which I think is an important signal that this administration is taking this seriously. But in the long term, there ought to be somebody want to figure that out. Hopefully we will get to that. The other thing is we do have to keep them accountable. All of us who are at this conference who have been advocates on this now have something to point to and say, you promised this. You know, when is it going to get done? Where are you on this? Um, And there will be follow-up meetings. There'll be multiple follow-up meetings and, and gatherings, and we will have the opportunity to get up and say, where are you on this? And I think the fact that, again, USDA held a, another meeting today is an indication that they're serious about this stuff. Some of us were worried we would do a conference and it would be absent a national strategy. 
they have a national strategy. That's good. Then our next worry was they'll have a national strategy and then we'll never hear from anybody again. That has not been the case. And so I'm giving the Biden-Harris administration the benefit of the doubt that they are serious about this. But it's up to us to, in a very nice and constructive and friendly way, like we always do, remind them that they made promises and we expect them to keep those promises. If not, we are going to call you out. It's that simple. So, uh, yeah, let's push for that coordinator, that point person, that office that will be there. But let's also understand that we have a responsibility to really keep the pressure on. Can I just answer that too, Mike? Sure. So I just want to echo and highlight everything that uh, Congressman McGovern said. And so right now you have the president, Susan Rice, the secretary of agriculture and the secretary of HHS all committed. That's incredible, right? That's incredible. So that's an incredible group. You also have several congressmen and, and women and several senators who are really committed to at least aspects of the plan. That's incredible. Not a lot will happen unless the public and the private sector and the advocacy sector keep up the pressure and really talk to these folks because they have other priorities too. There's the war in Ukraine, there's energy issues, there's pollution, there's going to be another virus someday, right? There's all kinds of other things. And so while they're all committed to it, it really is up to the people on this call to really keep up the pressure. And beyond the people in the federal government, we have to keep up the attention to governors. We have to keep up the attention to mayors. We have to keep up the attention to CEOs of healthcare organizations and food sector companies and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, We have to keep up the pressure to the heads of foundations and how they invest their dollars and money. Food is the single Mm -hmm. biggest problem facing the country that we can actually fix in the next 10 years. I think we're at a We all knew this. Marion knew this. Mike, you know this. This is why you created CSBI. This is why we've done the work we've done. We have a historic moment and a coming together where we could actually have a tipping point and really start to see things move in the right direction. To get to the issue of oversight, in the 1970s, the Senate Select Committee on Hunger, Nutrition, and Human Needs with Senators Dole and McGovern was extremely effective. They held, I don't know, dozens of hearings on hunger and nutrition. It seems like that sort of thing is an entity that could keep the pressure on the success of administrations. Is there any chance of getting such a committee on the House or the Senate? Oh, I I would love to see that a, a committee like that. It's a challenge to create another committee. That's why I turned the rules committee which I chair into basically a semi-select committee on nutrition and human needs. And we've done dozens of hearings and we've done dozens of site visits all across the country leading up to this conference. The Agriculture Committee has a responsibility to do oversight hearing. The Education and Labor Committee does. The Energy and Commerce Committee does. And whether they do that will depend on who's chairing those committees. The bad news has been some of these issues we're talking about have been politicized and become partisan issues over the years. The good news is that We're starting to reach out and get more bipartisan support on some of these initiatives. This conference, we've been requesting it forever, but we did a formal request. Myself, a Democrat from Massachusetts, Cory Booker, a Democrat from New Jersey, Jackie Walorski. Unfortunately, we lost her to a tragic car accident, but a Republican from Indiana and Senator Braun, a Republican senator from Indiana, all joined together in requesting this. Senator Bill Frist, Republican from Tennessee, was at the conference, was on a panel. What I'm finding is that there, at least at the state legislative level, lots of Republican state reps and senators, some Republican mayors are expressing an interest in this. So we need to continue to try to build that McGovern Dole, if you will, bipartisanship on this. It is hard because let's be honest, the challenges that face a lot of poor people in this country have been politicized. People who are living in poverty have been demonized. Their struggle has been diminished. It has been grotesque what I have seen happen over the last 20 years here. We need to try to figure out a way to fix that. And if not, we got to beat them. It is that simple. We just have to be persistent and we have to win because this above all is a moral issue. And I have seen too many hungry people in Massachusetts and around the country. If you see a hungry child, it breaks your heart. If it doesn't, you are not human. Senior citizens who are in emergency rooms because they've taken their medication on an empty stomach, it is unacceptable. The richest country in the history of the world, and we've got close to 40 million people who don't know where the next meal is going to come from. If we can afford to spend gazillions on bombs and nuclear weapons, we ought to be able to afford 
what is necessary to solve this problem and also to deal with this other issue of diet-related diseases. We can do this. And I think outside of Washington, there's a lot more bipartisan support. We just have to build on it. It is important to me, and I think to everybody else who is listening, as I know it is to the other panelists, that this isn't just a report that sort of lands with a thunk, that there continue to be meetings. One comment that I had is in the lead up to this, I knew many people who wanted to get involved and to be helpful and to be part of it, and they didn't find a way in. So I ask you, Congressman McGovern, help us find a way to be involved because there is a wider group of organizations and people and passion all around the country who feel, as you all do, that food is existential for everyone. And with a note of real gratitude for each of the speakers to take some time out of their busy schedules and spend an hour with us. And thank you to each of you, to the Congressman McGovern, to Marion, her new book is wonderful, to Dr. Mazafarian, who is just exceptional, and to Kristen Toby, whom I admire for many of these years. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Heritage Radio Network and to Food Scribe. There was a lot of effort that went into making this happen, and I, I'm just thrilled. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to you, our listeners, and to the Biden administration for holding the White House Conference on Food, Hunger, and Nutrition. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.